Welcome to another message on parables. All the parables of the Bible. This is number 92 on all the parables of the Bible. We have gone through all the Old Testament and we're now in Matthew, the 12th chapter. And verses 30 through 35. 30 through 35 is where we're going to be with the first one, the parable of the tree and the fruit. Now, we have to go back a little bit up here in Matthew, the 12th chapter. The um, Pharisees and the scribes had accused Jesus of doing miracles by the power of Beelzebub. And then he gave us the parable of the strong man. And he told them that basically that you have committed the sin, the unpardonable sin. You have no hope of salvation because you are wicked wretches, sons of the great serpent in the Garden of Eden. And he's going to say that again in these verses also. Verse number 33 says, Either make the tree sound, healthy, and good, and its fruit sound, healthy, and good, or make the tree rotten, diseased, and bad, and its fruit rotten, diseased, and bad, for the tree is known and recognized and judged by its fruit. Now Jesus is turning on them again, and he's using the parable of the tree and the fruit He's showing them that they are wicked. You offspring of Abraham? You offspring of Adam? You offspring of uh, Jacob? No, he said, you offspring of vipers. How can you speak good things when you are evil, wicked, twisted, corrupt? For out of the fullness of the overflow of the superabundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. They had accused him of this. Accused him of doing miracles by the power of the devil, or Beelzebub. And Jesus said, You have committed the unpardonable sin. You blasphemed against the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God is what gave all of the writers of the Old Testament the inspiration to write each and every one of those books. The good man from his inner good treasure flings forth good things. And the evil man out of his inner evil storehouse flings forth evil things. Now let's go back and read what Herbert Lockyer says about these verses. We may do a couple of parables. In returning to the symbol which he, which he had already used in his ethical manifesto, Jesus seeks to illustrate the dishonesty of his foes. Who are the foes? The Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the scribes, the Levites, the Herodians, the, Sadduc the Sakari, the Hellenistic Jews the dishonesty of his foes and enforce his claims against opposition. Jesus is Messiah, King of Israel. He is not an imposter. Many imposters came before him and many imposters have come after him. How could any honest mind attribute good to an evil source? How could any honest mind attribute good to an evil source? Jesus was healing people. He was healing the blind. And they were saying you're doing it by the power of Satan. You got these dark powers when you were down in Egypt. How could this victory over Satan come from complicity with Satan? What Christ asked was for honest judgment. Except the fact that both the tree and the fruit are good. Both the tree and the fruit are evil. But do not believe that the tree is bad and its fruit is good. It's not going to happen. But the dishonesty of the Pharisees was a treasure of evil in their hearts. A treasure is a storehouse. They had a storehouse of evil in their hearts. How could they promote good as evil and evil as good? Revealing the venomous malignity of the hearts of, the, of his enemies, Jesus utters a solemn warning of, about their words developing into a great crime and damning their souls damning their souls. They have no hope. Anathema. Anathema is a term 
It is a pagan term. It's Greek. Ana antithemy is where it comes from. And it means to go in and place something on a wall like this um, picture depicting the tabernacle of the Old Testament. You take this into a pagan temple and put it on the wall, you can never redeem it and buy it back. I don't care how bad you want it, you could never get it back again. It was there for good. If you gave some family heirloom to the temple, you could not get it back. It's not redeemable. You could not recover it before any means. You would not die for it and get it back. It's, it's forever placed upon the wall. And so when Jesus anathemized them, it meant they were damned forever. Great crimes damning their souls. Idle, as used by Christ, implies that words can be mischievous as well as needless. The words of the Pharisees formed no innocent jest. They were the index of their graceless hearts. Graceless hearts. How many of you are saved out there? Do you have God's grace in your heart? And I'm going to tell you something. When you have God's grace in your heart, you know that you're forgiven of your sins not because of what you have done or will do ever, but because of what Jesus did for you. Graceless hearts would rise up to condemn them in the day of judgment, applying the truth to the Pharisees. Jesus asked, how can, how can you, being evil, speak good things? He wanted them to apply his illustration of the tree and the fruit to himself and his work. Jesus was doing good works. Jesus was raising the dead. Jesus was healing the blind. Jesus was healing the sick. Jesus was healing the maimed that no one could heal, no doctor. He appealed to these men to test him and to find out the secret of his ability by the things at which they were looking, the things done by the fruit produced calling good evil and ascribing divine work to Satan. The divine work of the Holy Spirit to Satan. And that is what we call the blasphemous or the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit or the unpardonable sin. Constituted the unforgivable sin, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, the inspirer of the works and words of Jesus. Now let's go back to 1238. Or going down from... 12, uh, 36. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, we'll have to give account for every idle, inoperative, and non-working word they speak. For by your words you will be justified and acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned and sentenced. And then, now here we go again, Jesus, every time he would do a good work, a miracle, a great sign from heaven, they would tell him it was coming from Satan. Now they're going to see, let this condemn you a little more. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we desire to see a sign or a miracle from you, proving that you are what you claim to be. And then Jesus uses this next parable. But he replied to them, an evil and adulterous generation that is a generation morally unfaithful to God. Morally unfaithful to God. What is more serious, a spiritual immorality or physical immorality? Spiritual. Spiritual immorality. Spiritual immorality. Now, Every man and every woman has a desire, well, nearly all of them do, to be with another person of the opposite sex. Okay, that's natural. That's natural, isn't it? But you have to reject God and God's truth to commit spiritual fornication. I'm not making the other okay, but I'm saying the worst of all sins is spiritual fornication. And they were, in, they were unfaithful to God. God had called them out of Egypt. 
And God took them out and brought them into the promised land, or to the edge of the promised land, into the wilderness for 40 years because they were not worthy to go in, except for Joshua and Caleb. And he gave them the law by Moses. And this was divine law to point them to Jesus when he would come. And this law should have shown them Jesus. The law and the prophets were until John. After that, the kingdom of God is preached because the king have come. Now, when the king came, they had to spiritually reject him knowingly. Jesus was born in the right year, at the right time, under the sign of the stars. And from the book of Daniel, it says when he was going to be born, when he was going to ride into the city of Jerusalem. He was born in the right town of the right tribe. He went down to Egypt like the Bible said he would. He came back down to Egypt. He went to Nazareth, a root out of dry ground. He began his ministry. The first thing he did was was to burn water into wine. These, what he was doing here, what he was showing here at this period of time was his messianic credentials. The king of Israel, if they would have accepted him, would have brought him 1,000 year reign of Christ. But they rejected him. He was showing them God's sample case of the millennial blessings, what God could do for them for 1,000 years. Epitaste gazed upon this earth. But he replied to them, an evil and adulterous generation, that is a generation morally unfaithful to God. They were morally, spiritually unfaithful. Mm -hmm. They were worse than pagans. The pagans were getting converted. But these religious adulterers were rejecting God. They were morally and spiritually unfaithful to God, and seeks and demands a sign. He said, but no sign shall be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Remember when they accused Jesus of coming out of Galilee that no prophet came out of Galilee. Jonah did. Jonah came out of Galilee. The great prophet Jonah. For even as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster that Leviathan that he was swallowed by. So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Jonah 1 and 17. Look at this. The men of Nineveh will stand up at judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they have repented at the preaching of Jonah And behold, something more greater and more powerful than Jonah is here among you. Is here among you. Now let's go back and read from our textbook on page 170. We start on 169. The power of Jonah and the queen. 42, up to 42. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something one more greater and greater than Jonah is here. And the queen of the south shall stand up at the judgment. Who was the queen of south, the south? The queen of Sheba. Stand up with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. And behold someone more greater than Solomon is here. Now let's see what Mr. Lockyer says about this. Immediately after a great miracle had been wrought, a certain of the Pharisees sought a sign from heaven. They were spiritually blind. They failed to see that what they asked for was before them already. What they needed was not light, but sight. What they needed was what for Christ was in himself the great sign. But blind to the truth, they did not grasp the significance of either his works or his character. Having attributed his miracle working power to the devil, they now asked Jesus for a sign from heaven. Luke 11 and 16 where they thought the devil could not reach 
with his beguiling arts. But Christ replied that only the evil and adulterous seek after signs. While they, those who were blind to Christ's deity and messianship, could not have a sign which could convey the belief they could. They can and will have a sign overwhelming them with dismay, the resurrection of Christ after they had slain him. Would be the dread sign to convince them, he says, as Jonah was dead in Sheol for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the earth, in the grave. And he shall go also to Sheol, and he'll preach unto the spirits in prison there, and some that were disobedient in the days of Noah. And he says, to illustrate his death and resurrection, Jesus used the historic sign of Jonah, the sign that the Pharisees already had in their own literature, and which now Jesus applies to himself. Three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish was a sign to Nineveh. And such a mystic sign of a man coming back from the dead produced repentance in Nineveh and suspended this judgment for a hundred years. Do you know what the principal god of the Ninevites was? Marilyn, do you remember what the principal god of the Ninevites was? His name was Dagon. Dagon. And the word dog in Hebrew means fish. Fish. The fish god. And now guess what? This great leviathan of the deep swallows Jonah. And this is more than a sign. People, wake up. Let me show you something. Wake up. Turn the light on. Wake up. Turn the light on. Okay? If you look on your map of the Bible in the Bible continent where all this took place we find out that Jonah was in Galilee over here God told him to go to Nineveh up here and Jonah went that way 3,000 miles tried to to go to Spain and was sold into a sh in, in this ship the ship was about to sink. They threw him overboard, and he's out in the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the Mediterranean has to go... If you go to Nineveh, you have to go all the way around the African continent mm -hmm. and come all the way up in the Indian Ocean and then into the Persian Gulf and all the way up the great Tigris and Euphrates, all the way to Nineveh. Now, that's a lot of swimming people in three days or else that fish left the Mediterranean and went up on high and flew maybe it was a flying fish you know that flew all the way there but that was a great miracle right in itself nothing could how in the world did Jonah get to Nineveh when he was over there by Spain there's no inlet that goes in from the Mediterranean Sea you've got to go all the way around that fish swam its fish fins off Swam his scales off if it did that. I have no problem with God making that fish swim that 10,000, 15,000 miles in three days. Maybe. Or flying over ground over and then going up the river. But what happened here is they saw a great miracle. And he said, the miracle that Jonah, getting from the Mediterranean Sea all the way to Nineveh, was something. But greater than that is here. While those who were blind to Christ's deity and the messianic ship could not have a sign which would convey the belief, they can will have a sign overwhelming them with dismay. The resurrection of Jesus Christ after they had slain him would be the dread sign to convince them, and many still made excuses. To illustrate his death and resurrection, Jesus used the historic sign of Jonah, the sign that the Pharisees already had in their own literature, which now Jesus applies to himself. Three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. It said sea monster, dragon, leviathan. Was assigned to Nineveh. Now, when Moses and Aaron went down into Egypt, 
and did the miracles in Pharaoh's palace. They threw their rod down. Aaron threw his rod down, and it became a leviathan. It did not become a snake, not a nahash, but a tanin, a dragon like this. When Janice and Jamri threw their rods down, they became dragons. But God's dragons swallowed their dragons up. They're leviathans. Now, leviathan is a supernatural creature. And this is what probably swallowed Jonah. It was some supernatural great fish, dog, dragon. And such a mystic sign of man coming back from the dead produced repentance in Nineveh and suspended the judgment for a hundred years and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ would likewise be a sign establishing his claims as a son of God and also the divinity of his mission. He was divinity. He was divine. He was God. The word Jehovah in the Old Testament was never spoken after the law was given. Exodus 27. 20 and verse 7 says, Thou shalt not use the Lord thy God name in vain, for he shall require it of you. They never spoke the name Jehovah ever again. But they referred to him as Ha the Bar, the Word. And when John wrote in John 1 and 1, John 1 14, John 1 18, he talked about Ho Logos, Ha the Bar, the Jehovah of the Old Testament. In the beginning was Jehovah. And Jehovah kept on being in a separate part of the Godhead because Jehovah kept on being God. And then it says, Kaiho Logo Sarks again until, and the Jehovah flesh he became and dwelt among us. And we beheld the glory of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1 18, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten God, the one being, not only singular, master, and present, participle, active, the one being in the bosom of the Father, that one has led himself out. The word Jehovah means he who shall become. Jesus did become flesh. And dwell among us. We see him walking with Adam. We see him walking and appearing unto Abraham and to Moses in his pre-incarnate form. But now he's in flesh. Related to us. He's our Goel. He was asked for a sign and said, Destroy the temple, his body, and in three days I will raise it up. This is what they tried to convict him of saying this. The essential faults of the evil and the adulterous generation were denounced by Jesus. And whose like lies proved it to be condemned by the Ninevites who repented at the preaching of Jonah, but who were not moved to repentance at all. The call of the greater than Jonah was here. Then Jesus cited the queen from the south of Arabia who asked much to see and hear Solomon. This is Ethiopia, by the way. But there were these Pharisees blind in the fact that greater than Solomon was in their midst. That queen of the south, by the way, that queen of Sheba, she had a child by, by Solomon. And she went down and she had a, a copy of the Ark of the Covenant there. And those are what we call the black Jews, those black Ethiopian Jews. They traced themselves. Hail Selassie said he was a direct descendant of Solomon through Sheba. And they heard him speak as never a man spoke. And yet they only listened to catch some word with which to slay him, to murder him. The queen of Sheba praised Solomon for his wisdom bestowed upon him rich gifts. And those whom the Savior came, whoever saw no beauty in him, that they might desire him, and despised and rejected and slighted and slandered and slew and murdered him and lacerated him and lied about him, and perjured themselves. The Sanhedrin, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, says, Get you seventy men. Men that cannot be bribed. Men that are beyond reproach. And let them set in judgment. And there's where the Sanhedrin came from. But what were these? These were the bought and paid for politicians of this day. Our Heavenly Father, we send this message out. We pray that you will use it to lead people to you. To follow you that you use it to save souls because a greater than Solomon, a greater than Jonah, a greater than David, greater than Moses, greater than Adam is here. Father, we trust you. We leave our hearts at your feet. 
In Jesus' name we pray.